Yeah, it's a, it's just a small dot. <laughs> Very oh. small, tiny. <laughs> it's all right. Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. Welcome to our latest edition here of our Humphrey Center seminar series. It's my pleasure to introduce Feng Zhang from our own university uh, here at the, the plant and uh, microbial plant and microbial biology department. Sorry, I can't get that out. <laughs> um, so he's just visiting us here from down the street here. So uh, Feng uh, did his bachelor's and his master's at Baikai University in China. And then after that, he came here to complete his PhD uh, at Iowa State University in 2005 in the Department of Genetics and Development and Cell Biology. After that, he was a postdoc for a short time at the University of Georgia in Athens, and then back here at the University of Minnesota with Rio Stan Poitas at that time, yeah. uh, from 2008 to 2010. And then from there, he went to help go co-found Calix and became uh, Calix's research director for a couple of years until 2012. And then from 2012 to 2017, he was the chief operating officer at Calix here nearby in, in Roseville, working on the gene editing technologies. And since 2018, we've been fortunate enough to have him back here as a faculty member at the University of Minnesota, where he's an assistant professor in the Department of Plant and Microbial Biology, as well as in the Center for um, Precision Plant Genomics. So his research here focuses on the interplays between genome editing, DNA repair, and epigenetics. He works on implant and genome editing specifically for legumes, and he also has the projects related to synthetic genomics. So um, I think we're in for a real treat today. I actually was one of the co-organizers of a workshop at PAG a couple of years ago, and we had some speakers in there. Probably I was probably one of those speakers. The room was fairly empty, and as soon as phone was at the podium, the whole room just filled up and it's packed and it's standing in the I just point that out because Fung does good work. People are really keenly following uh, what he does. So I'm glad to have him here to give a seminar today. Thanks, Aaron, for inviting me and thanks for the very nice introduction. It's hard to live up to that. But uh, so, um, so I've been working on like plant genome engineering, editing for more than 15 years. And today I'm happy to share with you the most recent progress in my lab. We're really um, put our effort try to develop a precision genome editing technology and you know, large scale or high throughput way. Uh, we're not 100% there yet, but today I'm gonna show you some data. I think we're close and I'm gonna show you some applications. We, we leverage the technology to create a, a disease resistant trait in rice. So I, I think I don't need to uh, do the introduction to the plant breeding center. You guys know much better than me about all kinds of uh, breeding techniques. Um, to me, plant breeding, the biggest goal is to search and identify the novel genetic variants or beneficial genetic variants and combine them together to create high performing varieties. There are a number of ways you can create or search for genetic variants, um, but most of them in the past is involved. Oops. Um, did I do something wrong? Okay. Um, let's see, maybe something wrong with the share screen. I think it's the um, oh the is HDMI yeah, I think, think. I think it turned off. There oh, so technology <laughs> just made the edit. Yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um. So in the past, uh, most of those oops, um, don't move any. <laughs> <laughs> most of the technology involved in rather like uh, creating or induce a. Uh, mutations in random fashion and you have to go through or screen a relatively large population to identify the mutants. And about 20 to 30 years ago, the genome editing technology emerged as a new breeding techniques. Like 
first come up and classify as new breeding techniques. If you talk to regulatory agencies, um, so that's the first time we can do a more like a targeted uh, genetic modification. And then it have a potential to allow scientists and breeders to quickly create a novel traits uh, in a shorter timeline compared to uh, previous or other older uh, technologies. Oops. Let's see. Okay. So I've been working on this genome editing or back then we got the targeted genetic modification technology for a long time. Actually, it's kind of remind me when I prepared this talk. Uh, about 14 years ago, the, there are four independent groups kind of using different um, program nucleuses. At that time, we called first generation to create uh, gene added plants where one of uh, them and uh, actually, they, uh, we created the first, the very first gene added arbopsis on this campus. But at that time, it's pre CRISPR days. We're still using zinc finger nucleus. So, the first step of the current genome editing technology is develop or uh, design a program endonucleus, which can search, bend, and cleave the gene of interest. Okay, so in, uh, in the past 30 years, one of the most big um, theme in this field is to develop a better and a better programmable nucleuses. So we go from the first generation mag nucleus and zinc finger nucleuses to second generation tau um, nucleuses, which also develop at UMM. Um, I won't gonna go to the detail of those technologies, but keep in mind, those technologies involve in DNA binding, engineer DNA binding protein, and then it can recognize a new sequence, uh, which as sometimes is really clunky and it require a lot of effort to think, if you think about engineer a, a new uh, DNA binding proteins. And in 2012, a new technology CRISPR-Cas, I think now people pretty much refer the genome editing technology as a CRISPR technology. Now it's become a term. Whenever it become a term, you know, this technology kind of revolutionized the field like PCR, right? Um, it's very unique property of CRISPR-Cas. It's not gonna rely on or depending on the protein DNA recognition code. Uh, we're designing a, a, a new capacity or new binding searching activities through the RNA DNA pairing. If you think about it, it doesn't require any protein engineering anymore. You can just search your target and order an oligo and make your construct. It can search the genome and guide the endonucleus, which is a Cas9 in this case. Now we have different Cas variants. This system has been, can be um, already been uh, repurposed to do um, different functions. Um, long story short, right after this technology get developed, you see a lot of applications and publications starting using this technology to create different genetic modifications in different species. So the publication skyrocket and grow uh, exponentially. And if you look at the um, product, developer genome editing has also grow exponentially. By 2022, there are about two, more than 200 gene added product applications around the world. I think the speed is even going more like exponentially this year. I, I haven't do the update on 2023, but I expect that this number is gonna be doubled or even tripled in the next couple of years. So just speaking how powerful this CRISPR-Cas technology is, and we're in a good, really good time to think about and leverage the genome adding technology to create novel traits. So in my lab, uh, like I said, we are really pushing this technology with higher precision and a large scale. So currently we are working on three um, research pro uh, projects. One I'm gonna focus on today is 
by understanding the interaction or interplay between the CRISPR technology and epigenetic features and the DNA repair pathways, we can develop a better tools with higher precision. So I have another tool um, research project going on. I hope I can share you in um, future um, um, talks. One is we really develop a technology try to uh, simplify or minimize the tissue culture efforts. We're focusing on the legume, particularly the soybean. We want to be able to do a genome editing without tissue culture. Okay, and in a long term, we're really thinking about rewrite the whole genome at scale. Now we are starting with a synthetic centromere, try to build a mini chromosome using the uh, genome engineering technology developed in the uh, in the lab. So today I'm going to focus on the first part. Um, if you think about genome editing, and the, technically, you only need three different operations, deletion, insertion, or substitution. Okay, and there's at least three major DNA repair pathways allow you to create those individual edits. And if you, I, I won't gonna, uh, I'm not gonna go into the detail of each pathway, but if you just uh, want to create a simple gene knockout or disrupt gene function, you can use the non-homologous and joining pathway, NHEJ for short, disrupt or cleave it, uh, cleave the target site and rely on the pathway to create a small insertion or deletions. It's a very efficient pathway, but if you want more precise modification, you are gonna uh, for now, people are relying on homology direct repair, which um, you have to provide the donors after cleavage, uh, the double strand break repaired uh, by using the donor template and thus incorporate the mutation to the target site. If you look at efficiency, the NHEJ is much higher than HDR. And NHEJ is pretty dominant pathways throughout all phases of cell cycles. Um, and, uh, but if you look at the precision, HDR pathway probably is the one you really want to uh, be able to harness and manipulate. Um, still very difficult. It's only active in certain cell cycles and hard to manipulate and require a lot of different moving pieces. Um, in general, NHEJ pathway consider as more like a random indel or random insertion or deletion create more uh, stochastic uh, mutations, hard to control the outcomes. But people have been working on promoting or manipulating HDR pathway for many, many years. But still we are not get enough efficiency to use that. So I think it's a it's about time we need to think really outside the box. So what the question my lab has been asking is, can we manipulate this already efficient pathway, make that more predictable or eventually more precise? Can we leverage NHEJ to do more precise genome editing? Okay, that's today I'm gonna focus on. And we ask this question because a simple observation from this CRISPR-Cas um, mutation outcomes. So that's the initial model. People think about what, what happened after, CRISP, uh, after the CRISPR-Cas. When you target site, they're gonna cleave. You sequence, create blunt double strand break and using NHEJ pathway, they're gonna create a lot of time, small deletions, but frequently people observe this single base pair insertion. And it always happened in the same place. That get us very interested in where this one base pair insertion come from. And because one base pair insertion it's only have four different options. And it's the size is only one, right? Compared to small deletions, we have much better control if we can manipulate the pathway to get to towards to this one base pair insertion. 
And if you look at the human data, um, averagely, if you just do to survey, they have a huge data set on over 10,000 different sites. Averagely, they observe this one base pair insertion at about 20%-ish. We found the same thing by survey uh, about 100 sites in different plant species. So it's quite interesting uh, where this one base pair insertion come from, what's the mechanism, can we leverage that? So that's um, this project, how this project is started. So two questions I'm gonna address today, the mechanism and how we use that. So actually people, after people observe this, um, because in East and the human cell lines, they have a lot of tools to, um, um, to study um, different target sites and uh, different pathways. They propose a model to account for this one base pair insertion. Remember the initial model as CRISPR-Cas cleave the target site, create a blunt um, double strand break. Actually in this model, they suggest or they indicate or they propose CRISPR-Cas also create a standard cut, which produce as one NT phi prime overhang at the um, number four nucleotide upstream of the PAM sequence. Okay, if that happens, a specialized DNA polymerase can come in and fill in the gap, make that blunt again, and then ligate them back. That's how you see this one base pair insertion, which based on this model, it, it can explain why the one base pair insertion always happen in the number four nucleotide position. And also a lot of time, it's a duplication of this number four nucleotide. So ex explain a lot of things, okay? But you know this model is contradicted to the initial thought, only the blunt cleavage. And now we have more and more evidence suggesting yes, CRISPR-Cas can create steroid cuts and we can leverage that. So when we see this, we are trying to search for the gene in plants, also responsible for this one base pair insertion. Right? And then we look at all the DNA polymerase in plants. Here's a table suggest there are about 12 to 16 different DNA polymerase existing in uh, all kinds of eukaryotic systems. And this class called X family DNA polymerase, they're specialized for DNA repair, not so much involved in um, DNA replication. So in human and uh, uh, most uh, um, vertebrate species, they have four members of X family DNA polymerase. They're involved in antibody um, production and UV damage repair, translation, you name it. So it's important. And when we search in the plant genome, uh, it's quite interestingly, we only found one member of X family DNA polymerase. Uh, throughout from the low uh, land, uh, lower land plants to all the way to the flowering plants, uh, we only have one. And it's close to the DNA polymerase land. If we do the alignment, but it's only share like 30% similarity with human version lambda or uh, beta. Uh, and there some previous literatures try already study a little bit of this DNA polymerase lambda in our lapses, but there are no obvious phenotype if you knock out this DNA polymerase. And these two papers suggest they are, might be involved in double DNA strand break because they show very mild phenotype sensitivity. And one paper also suggests they might be involved in tDNA integration, but we, we have different opinion on this because we, we can create a TD insertion, no problem, even in this now called mutant. But anyway, we go ahead, order a mutant line or biopsies, try to look at whether we you know, use this mutant line um, 
can we see altered genome editing profile? Okay, just to remind you, here's the wild type data from our biopsies. You can see one base pair insertion happening in the number four position. Uh, in this time, it can be a uh, different type of insertions. And today I'm not gonna touch on why there are gonna be different types. We have some hypotheses, um, but again, it's quite interesting if we use this lambda mutant as a background. As genetic background, we introduce CRISPR-Cas, Cas9 and cleave the same target. You see the deletion profile roughly the same, but all the insertion is gone. Okay, doesn't matter which type of insertion we're talking about. So it suggests this Herblopsis DNA polymerase lambda is responsible for the one base pair insertion. Okay, and we also check a number of other sites in different chromatin context because there are some suggestion as DNA repair pathway also heavily influenced by chromatin context. We, just, we want to make sure this lambda is working universally regardless or uh, irrespective to the uh, chromatin context. You see in the wild type background, we have a different rate of one base pair insertion at different size, but at the mutant background, they all down to a uh, base level, which means they sometimes we detect that we are using uh, next generation sequencing as a readout. So we, we see a significant reduction of this one base pair insertion. Again, let's just um, indicate this DNA polymerase lambda also responsible for one base pair insertion in plants. Okay, now the model gonna become to uh, the CRISPR-Cas cleave creates the blunt double strand break and create one base pair insertion or small deletion. Now the model become to, it can create both double uh, blunt end or staggered cuts. Okay, for the blunt end, you have axonuclease activity present in the, uh, in the cell, which creates small deletions. It's also a very interesting area we are looking into. Um, but now our data suggests DNA polymerase lambda is responsible for infusing these gaps and create one base pair insertion in plants as well. So we found the gene. We have hypothesis think we are close to figure out the mechanism. Can we leverage it? Because now two things, we know stair cut happening. We know um, Lambda is responsible to fill in the gaps. One thing we've been thinking about, the advantage of this one base period insertion. If we can leverage that, if we can improve the one base period insertion frequency on every single site. It's nearly guaranteed you knock out the gene, right? Because it's a one base pair insertion. So for now, if you're using CRISPR-Cas to knock out the gene, you probably have to screen your progenies or the added population to, add, to make sure you really knocked it out. If it's a deletion, make sure it's not still in frame, right? But by doing that, increasing one base pair insertion, we can get high frequency gene knockout, particularly used for if we are targeting multiple genes. We don't need screen much anymore, right? So that's for gene knockout. There are two ways we can continue improve because at, remember I show you the pie chart about 20% of overall mutagenesis or mutations are one base pair insertion. We want to improve that. We want to get to 80%, even 90% is, poss is that possible. Okay, so one way is we can manipulate the cleavage to create a more staggered cut. There are literally showing there's some mutation you can do, you can uh, create a Cas9 variant which more prone to uh, staggered cuts. We're testing that, we're making uh, saturated mutagenesis in that region and to promote staggered cuts. 
That's one strategy. The other is increase the DNA pore lambda activity. And because if this enzyme, this polymer is responsible, if we have a higher activity, it can fill in, then it's get fixed. It's not gonna go back or get recut. Because a lot of time, they make cleavage, they ligate back perfectly. So they're going back to the circle, okay? If we can create one base pair insertion as disrupted binding site, the mutation get fixed. So increasing DNA polymerase lambda activity as a, could be another strategy. By saying that, one prediction is at least we can overexpress this polymerase lambda in our lapses in the mutant background. So the two prediction, if we do that, first, if the lambda is really responsible and we knock it out, then we do this complementation assay, we should restore the one base pair insertion. And if we get a higher, uh, if we overexpress this enzyme activity, and we might get even higher one base pair insertion rate. So that's what we observed. That's a wild type insertion rate, again, at, in different chromatin contexts. And in a lambda mutation or in lambda knockout background, we overexpress the DNA polymerase gene. What we observed, they at least restore the one base pair insertion rate. At some cases, we get high mutation rate. Like in this example, the one base pair means in, uh, mutation rate from the single plants can go from about 25, 30% to all the way 60%. I think we still have room to improve that because we just overexpress that. And the lambda has been recruited on the site using an N terminal domain. So our next approach is going to be recruit this DNA polymerase lambda on the cleavage site. My prediction is we're going to see even higher one base pair insertion rate and which we can get a higher gene knockout frequency. Okay, we're testing both using a uh, Cas9 variant and a plus recruiting the um, DNA polymerase lambda on the site. So what I'm telling you is actually NHEJ pathway is not that random. Okay, we have, we probably have the way to predict the outcomes. It could be species dependent. I have another whole new story. Uh, maybe I can share you in the future, but at least right now we think it can be predictable and we can manipulate that. That's the story for the gene knockout by improving or by understanding this pathway and improving the one base pair insertion. What about target knocking? So if you think about a lot of time, people want to create a transgenic plants. Uh, if you just use a tDNA, a lot of time they just randomly, relative randomly insert into the genome. You have to screen a population, make sure your transgene didn't or does not interrupt the essential genes. They land into the place which conducive to expression. So there are a lot of screening efforts. And you have to go through regulatory hurdles to get that approved, right? So targeted insertion has been um, highly desired to create transgenic plants, particularly if you think about if you can um, identify we call safe harbor region, which have no essential gene, which is pretty amenable for gene expression. You just keep targeting that single site. And it also helps you streamline the regulatory approval. Uh, so far, the target insertion um, strategy, people do try to leverage homology-directed repair pathway, which is HDR pathway. Okay, it's very, very inefficient. We're talking about 0. Point something percent if you're lucky enough. You have to screen a lot of population to get that. But NHGJ pathway is 
sufficient enough or very efficient. And it makes the cut. If you provide donor at certain frequency, you might observe the insertion at your cleavage site. But the downside is a lot of time you're going to see uh, imperfect junction because that's the nature of NHEJ. Particularly in the old days, we use the finger and the toe. And people actually try to develop NHEJ-based target insertion or target knock-in long time ago before CRISPR's, uh, CRISPR's days. So the idea is if we can create a staggered cut, it's easy to using fingers or tau and nucleus. And then you can treat this like a restriction enzyme ligation process. And at a certain frequency, you can get a perfect ligation. It's a numbers game. Okay, in that paper, it's quite interesting. They conclude Cas9 because it creates blunt end. It's not suitable because this um, end capture stretch. But now we know at certain frequency, CRISPR Cas indeed it create a steric cut. Well, it's only one nucleotide overhang, but does that enough to help us? create precise target insertion. When I say precise, I'm looking at I'm looking for two things. First, the junction can be perfect, like it. There are no small indels. Um, second, we can control the orientation of your target insertion. Okay. If our hypothesis is true, the CRISPR Cas cleave the tar site, I show you two examples to create a staggered cut. In this example, it created AT overhang. In this example, we, uh, it created TA overhang. Okay, we can test this hypothesis by providing oligo, double strand oligo donors and in you know, a prod plus based assay. Okay, we've done that. And the trick we found if we want to get a high efficiency of target insertion, we have to protect the donor, which we use uh, phosphorylated uh, backbone, which protect those donor from derogation because they're short. After we do that, after we have the overhang matching overhang sequence to the cleavage side, we should predict if the overhang like this, in this case, we can get a target insertion um, in one direction, and in that case, it's going to be in opposite direction. Okay, that's a testing system, and then we go ahead to test that. If we use blunt and overhang, it's easy. You just order all oligos, make double strand donors, right? For target one and target two, we see pretty much 50% 50, 50 orientation. The first thing we are looking at is insertion orientation. As soon as we start using the overhangs, you see, we can control the insertion orientation. It suggests the stair cut, yes, it's happening. And we can leverage that to control the insertion orientation. Okay, what about the precision? Well, using the blunt end, we test um, there are both orientations, the fraction of precise, which means um, no indels at the junction side is about 30-ish percent. If we use a overhang donors, we can get up to 60% of target insertion, a perfect seamless ligations. So that gave us, a, and make us very excited because now we can leverage these staggered cuts. Now we have a number of Cas9 variants allow us to create more staggered cuts. That allow us to do a sticky end under capture. Use that strategy to control the target insertion, orientation, and the precision. And um, can we apply that? And so far, what I showed you, we only demonstrate we can do that using a thin size oligos because 
we protect the end, you can order that chemically modified oligos, you can make double strand, it's super easy. The oligo so far, we can go up to 200 base pair. Okay, size is a still a limitation for the current technology, but it's perfect for cis element engineer. Okay, because most of cis element, um, cis regulatory element is small, size is small. And there are a number of examples people are showing the cis regulatory element is important to fine tune the traits to create a novel phenotypes. Like their examples, they create a number of deletions at the promoter region for tomato, they improve the mare stem size, uh, thus they get a high yield uh, tomato. And their one case is they um, insert a strong promoter in some tissue specific expression genes, and they can fine tune the gene expression. Okay, but in this technology, they are still using HDR based pathway. Okay, one idea we've been thinking is also linked to my uh, talent days as Zanzamanas um, as a pathogen for our, a wide range plant species. What they do is they inject serotype mm -hmm. 3 secretion system, the tau uh, transcription factor with the tau DNA binding domain they recognize the effector binding element in different susceptibility genes or sometimes R genes. They reprogram the plant disease pathways. So they can either make the plants or um, they, they can induce the a, a, um, uh, susceptible phenotypes. The idea is can we now in different effector binding element in front of a R gene. So different than monas, they have a different signature of the tau transcription factors. They recognize different binding sequence. So by doing that, we want to create a string inducible R gene expression. We want to create, we want to make sure the R gene only get turned on when the specific stream start infect the plants. Okay, and I think our oligo size is perfect fit that application. So this um, project was collaborate with Bing Young's group in University of Missouri. Um, we found a rice line has a small R gene which have a broken promoter. Um, this R gene uh, is not uh, expressed because of broken promoter. And here's a Tata box, and there are a CRISPR Cas recognition size in front of this Tata box is perfect in terms of the distance. And we designed two uh, different effector binding element, which one is about 60 base pair, the other one is about 50 base pair um, in size. Uh, one binding site is specifically recognized by Asia, uh, that's a mana string, and the other is recognized by Africa string. Okay, we do uh, we use a biolistic, we code deliver the CRISPR Cas and the double strand donor oligos with chemical protection, and we identify inalkene plants with pretty good efficiency and also. Uh, as we expect, um, the R we can also control the orientation. Okay, here's the agarose gel just showing you the way we, um, we can quickly screen the uh, transformants and identify the uh, Nalkin positive plants. And also, we follow those T0 plants to next generation, we get a herbal Nalkin lines and we check the uh, R gene expression levels is only responsible to the specific strains. If we have the um, uh, binding elements uh, responsible for the Asia strains, it, the R gene only get turned on when the uh, Asia strain infect the plants, vice versa. 
we see this in the Africa streams. So the phenotype exactly match what we expect um, in this knockout or uh, knock in lines with the Asia stream um, funding site, uh, we see it's resistant to Asia stream infection, but not Africa stream. Okay, vice versa for the Africa stream um, element now in lines. So as has been demonstrated, this approach can allow us to do precise now king. And now what I'm showing you is we can do precise gene knockout and we can leverage the stack cut to do precise gene knock in, but only for a small size oligo or DNA fragment. Now we're leveraging these pathways to try to achieve precise large size DNA knock in. Because what we learn from this research is we need a more donor copy, we need to protect the ends, we need to make sure the ends are compatible between your cleavage site and your donor sequence. With that in mind, we're very, very close. Uh, one of my postdoc, uh, Jitesh is working on that. I think we are uh, have very promising preliminary data showing we can do high efficient, large size DNA knocking that allow us to knock in gas genes, which are about 2 KB uh, or even bigger. So that, um, I hope I can share that with you in um, um, next few months. So stay tuned. So what I'm showing you is just by looking at DNA repair pathway, it's gonna help us to better harness the repair pathway to control the editing outcomes. And people take DNA repair pathway for granted in plants. Everything we learned from the mammalian system because they're so ahead of us and can be applied to plants. Um, it's not true. There are many different components are not shared. And for this DNA polymerase lambda, we only have one member and mammalian system M4. And I have other evidence, actually, our plant-specific DNA polymers lambda have a different activity. It can install different type of nucleotide. Like I showed you, um, I, I, I have a dual activity. I, I, I don't have time to go into that. But my point is we have about 300 genes involved in DNA repair. A large number of those genes has not been really characterized it's just based on homology search, we think they involve in different process. And now we have tools we can, uh, we are developing a high throughput ways to really study how these 300 genes involve in different gene repair pathways. And so allow us to leverage them to get a more precise control. So with that, um, I want to acknowledge uh, this project has been led by my former graduate student, Trevor, and the current postdoc, Jitesh, and with help from current graduate students, Claire, and two very talented undergrad students, John and Oliver. And we have a number of collaborators. We're so fortunate. They're uh, very helpful and uh, um, help us to move along. And the project has been funded by a number of federal agency. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks a lot. Any questions for folks? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you mentioned engineering CAS 12 or uh, Okay, that's CAS9 yeah. uh, to have more overhangs. Why not use like CAS12A? Right. So um, CAS9 and CAS12A, um, in terms of their PAM location, CAS12A is unique. So PAM sequence in CAS9 is more like in the three prime end, or CAS12A is more five prime end. So if you think about the cleavage site relative to the PAM, Cas9 is very close to the PAM, and then it creates insertions that disrupt the bending site. So the Cas9 cannot recleave anymore. 
Okay, so you get fixed mutations. But for CAS12A, yes, it creates three to four NT overhang, but it's more like towards to the three prime N. If you cleave, I have overhang. And then when the fill in come in, it's perfect to restore that sequence. It can re-cleave until they create a deletion to disrupt the spanning site. You won't see the re-cleavage anymore. That's why if you look at the mutation profile from CAS12A, it's all deletions. You never see any insertions. Um, but if you can use a pair of CAS12A, I think we have a project going on. You do can leverage these staggered lines. Yes, that's what we're going, but not just a simple one cleavage can help you um, doing the same thing as Cas9. Yeah. There's plenty of time. Any more questions? Yes, Steve. It's kind of in between hopefully you thought, but. How close are we to potentially having a reliable way to make single base pair substitutions? Yeah. Um, I, I don't have a chance to talk about that project. That's substitution, right? It's it's required even more precision, more control. There are a new technology like base editors, which allow you to uh, change the from C to T or A to G. Um, or they're a new technology called the prime editor. They combine the um, uh, CRISPR with a uh, reverse transcription technology provided the donor. Um, the efficiency in a lot of cases is still low, but my prediction is because the repair pathway, they quickly fix those mutations. That's why one strategy we're looking at is combine that technology with the different mutants we collect from our biopsies. For example, for prime editing, people demonstrate it's working in monocots. If you look at the literature, all the publication is monocots, like rice, wheat, um, um, probably those are the two main ones. But people say dicots is so difficult, which is really confusing. Why, what, what, what make dicots special, right? So that's, that's something I think there's a lot of room to improve. But I think if you ask me to, to predict, I think we're close. Probably in the next couple of years, you're gonna see a breakthrough uh, plant prime editing uh, as possible. And you can create a very precise substitutions. Yes. Yeah, no. Tell us a little bit more about the capacity in the genome engineering uh, center. Mm -hmm. You know, as someone that is leading the, the collaborating program, <laughs> and we've domesticated ten crabs for yes. eight years without using gene editing. Right. And the reason we haven't used gene editing is because of all of our end users, like General Mills <laughs> and on and on. All the food companies have told us, don't waste your time yeah. doing it because we will not use that product. Right. Right. And right. Same thing with Jim Anderson and his wheat. Yeah. Uh, um, so within your center, you have a policy group. You have a policy group working with the Humphrey Institute or some other group in the country to really think about this time around, not making the big mistake that yeah. certain folks did uh, in the mid 90s. Make sure that this work that you're doing and others are doing, right. CRISPR and beyond, actually finds a home in the, in the food marketplace. Right, right. It's it's excellent question. I mean, um, the short answer is we should, but we have. I think policy influence policymakers or help the regulatory agency to think through this to have a more streamlined framework in place help us to well, it's not just the policy yeah it's more than that it's the, yeah. it's the consuming public right um that needs to be brought into into the conversation yeah we're gonna dead in the, we're gonna dead in the technology right 
I, I think the tide starts shift a little bit. If, if you look at how, how different countries react to this, right? Like Japan, they're usually, they used to be very tight on GMOs. They don't allow any GMO product on the market. But now they're arguably the first to release the very first gene added tomato on market. So in the EU, they just have the parliament, I, I think the, the, the discussion, they have favorable uh, uh, terms now to deregulate gene added product. I think it's going to come down to also how you detect gene added product. That's another thing which, you know, I, I don't want to get into. It's a lot of <laughs> gray area. But yeah, I think educate the consumers and Japan already released the tomato, gene added tomato. Pairwise, they're releasing a lettuce. Does that help the consumer embrace or I I think we we, we should talk how we avoid I, I think I, I got it. how we avoid the same mistake we made like 40 years ago. So they have a part of that big debate in science. Yeah. And that was just a huge, huge mistake. It results in the framework that Jim Anderson can't <laughs> uh, use the technology to, to advance his uh, spring wheat. Right, right. Because it doesn't fit at all in mean, the consumer's <clears throat> plate. So, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, I talked to Steve a lot, like before we were thinking about stack, like multiple disease resistant genes, right? Right. But if the market push back, that's well, where are we going to go? For me, it's a big deal. Yeah. Right? And we have these centers, and I think the centers, even for, for Evergreen, yeah. having a policy component, I, I think it has to be part of our science. Yeah. Our science can't be just sitting over here doing science. Right, right. There has to be this component. And I said policy, but there's a social yeah. component to, to yeah. so going beyond policy. Right? Yeah, we, we used to have a person working on that field, and she moved to North Carolina, and we used to work with her in the past. Yeah, we all yeah. know who that is. That's right. <laughs> so that left a huge hole here. Yeah. Right. For us. Right? Yeah. Out of the Humphrey Institute. And yeah. I think there's the four of us. That should talk about, yes. about, about that. Yeah. Because all of the 12 Wargreen crops are under development. We have to stay out of that. So, you know, right. So as we go through the commercialization, but we can certainly use it for you know, proof of concept. Right, right. right. But uh, in terms of moving it directly into the mainstream, uh, we have basically have been told by end users. Yeah, I, I agree. We should join force and really push that part. As well, yeah, yeah. I think we used to have a workshop, right? Like we have one day workshop. Everybody takes service. Everybody participate. I don't know where now. Well, but... Forever Green did that, right? Yeah, like the Walton Family Foundation. Uh, right. There, there wasn't enough structure behind it. Yeah. Right. So I would I would like to take it from Forever Green and dump it into your senses. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Terms of actually having yeah. a continued conversation and really strategically thinking through how to present the science right. in a way that's under better understood and better accepted by, by the consumer. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I fully agree. It comes back to the academic world to help get played. Yeah, it's easy for academic people to say, you know, I just focus on my research, that's it. But, you know, in the long term, we need to really think collectively moving the well, this part it, it, as it well. So it's connecting our basic science to yeah. the global arts world. Yeah. That we have in the, at this University of Minnesota. Yeah. That core into the conversation. Yeah. Um, by the way, we are doing biomuseum outreach. So I, I, I probably you know, as well. Maybe we can bring something together. So yeah. Okay. Cool. Sure. Uh, so on the you talked about you're working on the, 
the promoter editing promoter yeah. assertions, uh, the system owner swapping things like that. So yeah. you're up to 50 base pairs or so around yeah. Yeah. insertions. So it's right. like that you're able to extend that to maybe 2,000 base pairs with the gust genes. How, right. how, far, how far can you go? Or are there any biological limits in terms of the insertions you can, you can make using? I, I definitely think there can be a limitation. So in terms of tDNA, I think we can get cargo edge to 50-ish kb, oh. but in terms of how much they can get insert, we don't know yet. We try to push like 10 kb now. Uh, let's see, I, I, I think, yes, the, the, the bigger the cargo we're talking about, the more like nuance, maybe there's some imprecise um, at junction side, we're going to see. Um, people tried HDR, um, the larger cargo, the, the larger they can go, the more impre imprecise at junction they see as well. So, yeah. Hey, Don. How far off are we from having a, a support lab that could actually, for example, take a kind of press out one Yeah. To be able to identify. And the person is on a work still. <laughs> <laughs> it's broader than just that, but in terms of a service lab that yeah. uh, we've identified the genes. Right, right. Uh, so and, and basically have to just work. Yeah. After that, in terms of, of, uh, of doing the, the, the insertion of the mutant right. gene. Right. How long are we from having that type of service facility inside the institution, or don't we have a plan to do that where we have to be sent out to the outside? Yeah. Sources? So that's something I, I think we really need to talk because, in terms of expertise, human resource, we have it. We have multiple labs working on different species. Uh, but we just lack of support, allow us to create that center just provide service because you know if we're talking about different species we need probably hire different expertise or different people but one thing i think can be really really interesting to watch is this uh, tissue culture free gene editing i think we are leveraged virus to do that I, i'm not saying we're going to get regulatory clearance anytime soon i'm saying just for proof concept for create to like validation it could be super quick that's one thing i work with steve and uh uh Scherer. uh we, we try to think maybe we can bring a usda center first where where we're working on that definitely it's something if we came whole group of us yeah <laughs> should be that should get together and we think that through yeah good advances new crops we do need access to that technology yeah I, I fully agree. Yeah. Inside or outside. Yeah. I think it's going to take a collective effort. Um, yeah. We, we, we can definitely talk. Yeah. One more. Uh, I was wondering uh, for the one base pair working insertions. So uh, I should maybe expect you to say Paul Lambda and Exxon Place competing for that. Yes. Base pair. Have, you, yeah. have you done mutants in either in XOs or? Paul Lambda to see if that your That's definitely what, what, what we're looking at. We have all the exonucleus mutant. We're going to overexpress uh, Lambda to see whether we can see even higher efficiency. That's definitely the model. There's some competing uh, a machinery or end processing uh, enzymes. If we, you know, that's more like scale, right? If you yeah. can we tip that? Yes. Yeah, that's really good point. Yes. Uh, we're working on that. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Well, All now, right, thank you. I don't know if you have gene editing applications, problems, questions, as long as one person can talk to you. Oh, thank you. That. We can build a second floor. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. We, we have empty space there. <laughs> Let's thank the floor again. Thank you.